Good day. Thank you for joining us to celebrate International Women's Day and to participate in a discussion um, today on the legality and morality of gender equality. My name is Rachel Bone Pittman, and I have the privilege to serve as the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA, or UNAUSA. In preparing for this program today, I reflected a lot on my own journey as a female leader. One of my most proud moments is where I am today. In 2019, I became the first female and first African American executive director of UNA USA, an organization that has been in existence for more than 75 years. Why it took my organization so long to put someone like me in this position, I don't know. But I do know we are not afraid of female leaders. Former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was a founding member of UNA USA and chairwoman of the board. She launched many UNA USA chapters across the country after shepherding the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights to fruition in 1948. Furthermore, in my six years at UNA USA, all the elected national council chairs have been women, one white, one black, and one now Latinx. And many of our UNA USA chapters are led by women. Furthermore, we have a robust UNA women affinity group that advocates for UN programs that advance women and girls rights and promote women empowerment on a global scale. Yet I am still the first to lead my organization. As one can imagine, it's unfortunate to, to be the first or the only, but we must start progress somewhere and build upon it. When only a little over a year ago, Vice President Harris said in her acceptance speech, I may be the first woman to hold this office, but I won't be the last. We all understood in that moment, the journey for gender equality and racial equity does not stop with her, it doesn't stop with me or any other first, seconds, or thirds. We must continue to build on progress until we must build on progress until we no longer must fight for our dignity, dignity or our rights. Now, to warm everyone up for our discussion today, I would like for you to take a quick quiz located in the chat on how discrimination affects girls and women around the world. So yes, hopefully you got a chance to, is the, there we go. I'll give you a couple seconds. This is just an eye-opening quiz um, for you to take once again about how discrimination affects girls and women around the world. And yes, these stats are unfortunate and disturbing, but we're going to dig into them and see how we can change their course. Today, you will hear from four phenomenal women leaders who will walk us through how we can take action to continue to support girls and women at home, at work, and leadership and beyond. And there is no better way to provide a framework for our discussion than bringing to the virtual stage Michelle Milford Morse, the United Nations Foundation Vice President for Girls and Women's Strategy, who leads organization-wide efforts to promote gender equality and the rights and agencies of all girls and women working in collaboration with the United Nations and its partners. So Michelle, I will hand it over to you. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I was muted. You'd think I'd know how to use these things by now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Rachel. Happy International uh, Women's Day to everybody. I'm still celebrating it. And uh, happy Women's History Month, too. So as Rachel suggested, we're going to discuss today the legal social challenges to gender equality and opportunities and how we can all together demand a fairer and freer future for all. But I want to say first, we're gathered at a moment when we have a very stark and real example of gender norms and their harm. Like all of you, I'm watching what's happening in Ukraine right now with a broken heart and a lot of anger. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. 
about the plight of girls and women in Ukraine and the gendered consequences of conflict, which are well documented and universal wherever it occurs. These include higher levels of gender based violence, conflict related sexual violence, human trafficking, maternal mortality, and early enforced child marriage as well. And we're going to have the opportunity to discuss a broader challenge. When it comes to conflict, men are historically and, and typically the authors of war, and girls and women are typically its weapons and its casualties, including its social and economic casualties. We're going to talk about inclusion and leadership in general, which is always necessary in the realms of peace and security. Women must not be excluded from their rightful place as peacekeepers, peace builders, and peace negotiators, although they often are. And the evidence for this is clear, by the way, because involving women in conflict mediation and peace negotiation makes peace treaties more likely, more durable, and longer lasting. So we must have women at all levels of decision making when it comes to the conflict in mm -hmm. Ukraine and all others around the world as well. I want to note that the UN is working to quickly respond to the crisis and prevent further harm. And the UN Foundation is very proud to support uh, the UN Ukraine Humanitarian Fund, which ensures that life-saving aid reaches people affected by the conflict, including girls and women. And we encourage you to donate what you can. There's a link uh, to the fund in the chat now. For our conversation today, however, I'm really pleased to be here alongside my esteemed panelists, deeply admired panelists, to discuss the persistent and stubborn inequalities that continue to hold women back from achieving their full potential at work, in the media, in our communities, and also at home. So we are just now uh, in the midst of our annual Equal Everywhere campaign at the UN Foundation. And you, hopefully you've seen it. It's motivated by the need to make these inequalities visible and by the fact that though equality is the birthright of every girl and woman, it is not her reality. Simply put, there is no place or part of life where girls and women are treated equally to boys and men. This year, our campaign is focused on discriminatory laws and norms that form the bedrock of these inequalities across the globe. Gender inequality remains enshrined in our laws, in our policies, and our norms, and they pervade every sphere of daily life. Consider that on average, women are afforded just three quarters of the legal rights as men, and more than 2.5 billion girls and women around the world are affected by discriminatory laws and a lack of legal protections. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, women's economic freedom and opportunity were deeply challenged throughout the world. Now this is an issue exacerbated by bad habits, bad norms, and bad laws. In the workplace specifically, unequal pay, lack of leadership opportunities, unsafe workplaces, and insufficient paid leave continue to hold women back in their careers. And unfortunately, Progress has been stubbornly slow and has reversed in many cases. I think we're going to have a slide for you, but consider that since 1995, when the world gathered for the Fourth World Conference on Women at Beijing, um, it was a notable high water mark for gender equality with the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. This was still a moment of, of, um, of enthusiasm and ambition for the world and gender equality. But look what's happened since then. Global and US labor force participation rates have slightly decreased. And then an analysis of the pay gap of 70 countries shows that it, the pay gap is narrowed in many places, but not by much. Um, and only 70 countries have been studied. Also the share of women running Fortune 5100 companies has grown since 1995, since uh, 0% to 8%. Now at the UN Foundation, we're committed to addressing these economic inequities by advocating for five key policies to advance gender equality in the workplace. Uh, these are all aimed at essentially advancing SDG 5, and they in include ensuring pay disparity and equal pay for equal work, convincing, ad advancing women's inclusion and leadership. Also really important, implementing rigorous and transparent safe workplace policies. Uh, providing sick paid leave, um, family leave, sick leave, and encouraging men to utilize it, and then ending the use of gender stereotypes and diminishment and advertising. 
Advancing gender equality in the workplace is also one of the key focus areas of our Equal Everywhere campaign, uh, an initiative that benefits from the support and the amplification of UNA USA members. Thank you for being part of that. And for our Equal Everywhere campaign this year, we compiled a snapshot report of 50 of the world's most sexist laws, policies, and norms that are uh, affect us at home, in our communities, and in the workplace. Again, those domains we're going to address today, and also in leadership, in media, and in, and in technology. So I encourage you to go to our website, equaleverywhere.org, explore the full snapshot report as well as additional social, social media assets too, and there are lots of stories of uh, heroes for equality. And with that, I'd like to turn to our panel today for a discussion where we can have um, really talk about some of these domains and where inequalities and discrimination exist at home and in the community and in media. Uh, let's pre pre preview those first. So first at home, from domestic violence to child marriage to unpaid care to obedience and guardianship laws, some of the most egregious forms of discrimination against girls and women happen at home. And most urgently, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated what we've been calling the shadow pandemic of violence against girls and women. And particularly in the 32 countries with no laws against domestic violence. In the community, girls and women lack legal rights to control their own bodies, their property, or their movement. In fact, more than half of girls and women in 64 countries still can't make their own decisions about whether to have sex, whether to use contraception or when to seek health care. And nearly 40% of countries limit women's property rights. Across the world, these stubborn traditional cultural and social norms impede progress to providing girls and women with the same legal rights in the community as boys and men. So some of our experts are going to talk about that. And then also in the media, it's a problematic space. Stereotyping and diminishment in media are truly stubborn and persistent challenges um, to gender equality. And I think they're ones that don't get talked about uh, frequently enough. Consider this, even though girls and women represent 51% of the population, of course, there is a two to one ratio of, female, of male characters to female characters across advertising, film, and television. So thankfully today, I'm joined by three experts who will help us define these issues more clearly and offer solutions. So thank you to Seema, to Rachel, to Maha for joining me today. And Seema, my first question is for you. Hi there, Seema. Hi, Michelle. So good to be with you and so many friends and colleagues celebrating Women's History Month. Well, here's what I would like to start with. So some of the most pressing threats are to uh, women's bodily autonomy, their sexual and reproductive health and rights, not only in the United States, but also all over the world. So let us know, we wanna to talk to you about how is UAP working to address um, those challenges? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. You know, you um, shared a quote, uh, shared a statistic actually from UNFPA, and we have our partner, our very close partner, Rachel Moynihan, um, who represents UNFPA today. So I know she'll have more to add on this. But the quote, uh, the stat is really stark, right? And um, there's a related quote by UNFPA's executive director that kind of um, really puts it in perspective. I mean, what she says is that hundreds of millions of women and girls. Um, their lives are governed by others, you know, and so I think that's kind of the snapshot of where we are in terms of bodily autonomy. But one thing I want to spend a minute on is I think abortion access is top of mind for so many of us, especially those who live and work in the United States. And I want to mention abortion because there, you know, restrictions related to abortion impact about 700 million women of reproductive age around the world right now, right? And we all know on this call that abortion restrictions do not reduce abortion. What they do is that they drive women and pregnant people to risk their own health, to risk their own lives by seeking unsafe abortion care. And the reason I mention this is in the context of like the legality and morality of gender equality as this event is called, legality around abortion is one of the strongest proxies for women and girls and where they are treated with equality and where they are really afforded the opportunity to make decisions about their own lives. So I think that's a really important element as we think about the statistics um, that govern all of us. And the last piece around your question around what the Universal Access Project is doing is we engage with the US government to advance 
sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. And the reason we do that is that the U.S. has the, one of the largest global footprints on global health and human rights. And we're at a moment where our rights, our constitutional rights to have access to abortion is hanging by a thread in front of the Supreme Court right now. That's obviously incredibly dangerous for people living in the United States. It also sets a really harmful precedent around the world. And today we're expecting that the US Congress will make a final decision on a 2022 spending bill. And many advocates that we've worked with for decades were hoping that this bill would permanently and finally end the harmful discriminatory global gag rule, which cuts off essential healthcare access for people around the world. And most likely the bill will not do it. So there's a lot more work to do. Um, but I wanna close with two high points because I'm sharing some bad news. One is that there is a lot of progress around the world. You know, Colombia, I'm sure as many of you saw, just decriminalized abortion after many years of active, activism by feminist movements in the country, which is incredible news, both for the country and for the region. And I'm also, you know, as someone who's been working on this for about 20 years, I am really buoyed by this administration. Um, one of the things, and I wanna pick up on something Rachel mentioned at the outset, is that we've been really trying to bring a reproductive justice lens for the first time to US foreign policy. And this is the first time I've seen an administration open to this. There are actually dedicated foreign policy staff that um, it's their mandate to think about racial justice and equity as they work to advance U.S. foreign policy. And so at the Universal Access Project, we're really excited to be partnering with longstanding leaders in the reproductive justice movement to bring their thinking and their ideas and their wisdom um, to U.S. foreign policy tables for the first time. So I am excited by that. Seema, that is a bright spot, right? Bringing the realm of reproductive justice into the leadership of the U.S. government and making sure everyone understands what it, that is and its implications. But I'm struck by how your point is that women don't control their bodies all over the world and even in times of peace. So what are the prospects then for women to control their bodies in places where there's conflict? And for that, I wanna go to Rachel. Um, as I mentioned, the war in Ukraine is on everybody's mind. And I would love for you to tell us what is UNFPA doing in Ukraine and in neighboring countries to assist girls and women right now, and especially with regard to their, their safety and their bodily autonomy. Thank you very much for this uh, question, Michelle. It's, it's definitely at the top of everyone's mind. Before I jump into that, I just wanna acknowledge um, Seema's comments and just build on her comments, reflecting on, again, something our executive director, um, who's um, of Afro-Panamanian descent, she underscores often that restricting someone's access to um, any sort of healthcare disproportionately impacts women of color. And I think we just, it's important to say that here and it's important to say it out loud over and over again, because even in the United States of America, women of color are six to seven times more likely to perish in childbirth, um, which is unacceptable and um, preventable. And there are, um, there are a lot of drivers to that, which I'm not an expert on, so I'm not gonna go into those, but I think we just need to say it over and over again until something is done about it. So I just wanna underscore what Seema said, thank her for her remarks. And um, again, just just name, name what's true here. Um, so switching to Ukraine, um, again, thank you for this question. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening all. Uh, my name is Rachel Moynihan. Um, I work at the UN Population Fund and we are the UN's sexual and reproductive health agency. Um, and I wanna start with the words of Martin Griffiths who serves as the UN's um, relief uh, and humanitarian affairs coordinator. And that's um, OCHA, the, the UN's um, Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs Office is what the fund that was linked to earlier in this chat um, supports. So I'm trying to tie everything together here. At a UN Security Council meeting um, on February 28th, he said, today our most pressing humanitarian needs are for emergency medical services, including sexual and reproductive health services, critical medicine, health supplies and equipment, safe water for drinking and hygiene, shelter and protection for the displaced. So I just wanna echo his words here because very often you don't hear 
leadership lead with sexual and reproductive health. It's very easy for images of women who are pregnant or newborns to really lead the news cycle and for people to, to candidly fundraise off of that. But then when it comes to actually funding those things and finding the political will to put our money where our proverbial mouth is, it suddenly becomes political or uncomfortable for people to talk about. So I, I wanna underscore here that UNFPA is in Ukraine. We, uh, Seema and I actually got a chance to speak with our representative there, um, Jaime, who is in Ukraine. Our team is on the ground and delivering. They've had to move their operations because of ongoing troop movement um, that threatens civilians as we've all seen on the news. We have seen the bombing of um, maternity hospitals, really unspeakable violence um, towards civilians and towards civilian um, targets. Um, and I just wanna underscore that we, we are, the Secretary General has called, every UN agency, including ours, has called for a ceasefire on targeting of civilian targets, schools, maternity hospitals, apartment buildings. It is unacceptable and it has got to stop because nothing is, none of these needs are gonna be met unless this stops. Um, our team incredibly is still there. They are building on more than 25 years of work in both Ukraine and Moldova where we've had country offices. So as is so often the case with UNFPA, we're there before, during and after a crisis. Um, and we're committed to staying and scaling up. Uh, the things that we're doing more specifically is to meet some of the needs of the people who are both internally displaced and fleeing the country. You probably all saw the headlines today that over 2.5 million people have fled in less than a month's time, um, which is extraordinary. Again, we haven't seen this sort of conflict on the European continent since World War II. So um, our, our, our priority right now is um, the many women and children, especially who are displaced and who are fleeing to provide them with life-saving support for the physical and mental well-being. Um, at the start of the war, it's estimated in Ukraine alone, 265,000 women were pregnant and 80,000 of them will give birth in the coming three months. I'm gonna repeat that. 80,000 women in Ukraine are predicted to give birth in the coming months. And we know just from with our own eyes and ears from taking in the news that a lot of them are displaced and a lot of maternity hospitals have been um, destroyed. So, you know, if you're pregnant before a conflict, you don't cease being pregnant during a conflict. If you're pregnant before you flee your home, you're still pregnant. So you need access to sexual and reproductive health services. So what we're doing is we're scaling up, we're pre-positioning supplies at the Polish border. We are doing the best we can to bring in as much as we can, including everything from hospitainer size kits to these small little kit, which I'm happy to open and go through later if, if time allows, um, to deliver, to help um, women deliver who are on the move, who are on the run. These are low cost, absolutely life-saving, critical supplies that UNFPA is working to get in. I'll stop there. I could say a lot more, but I'll stop there and just express my gratitude for being here for this platform and my gratitude for our team in Ukraine. Rachel, thank you. I think we all share our gratitude for your team in Ukraine and um, hope you'll convey that. And hopefully we can talk a little bit more about this, but I'm underlining that 80,000 women are going to give birth in the next three months in the Ukraine. And that deserves that deserves some time to absorb. That's extraordinary. Thank you, Rachel. Maha, I'm giving you a really tough transition here because we're gonna transition from life and death and uh, motherhood and uh, childbirth in Ukraine to kind of the broader issue of equity and representation and stereotypes and disinformation in the media. These are certainly things that are being used as weapons in this war right now, so it's not irrelevant to our conversation, but it is a broader challenge uh, to gender equality. And so I want to hear a little bit about what you're doing at the UN Information Center and what, how you are tackling inequity through the, through the, uh, in, uh, in the community of, of media and representation and stereotypes. Of course. Um, and first of all, I'd like to start by thanking you for having me here. It's, it's really a privilege. Um, and I'd like to, you know, congratulate UNFPA 
um, for the remarkable work that's being done um, on the ground. I would like to tie in, you know, what the UN is doing in terms of, you know, information sharing um, to, to highlight the plight of the Ukrainians and um, the, the marginalized, the women and girls. Um, we make sure that the right spotlight goes to these women and their needs are highlighted, highlighting, for instance, um, the uh, UNHCR High Commissioner who went um, on, on national TV in the US and highlighted the plight of the refugee women and their needs. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that um, because it was covered so nicely um, by Rachel, but um, I'll come back to your excellent question. Um, as, as you know very well, women need to be seen and heard across all areas of our lives. And the media industry plays an important role in shaping cultural perceptions and attitude towards gender for better or for worse. Women are underrepresented severely in the media and we, we are seeing this in, in the Ukraine coverage. Um, the print and digital media tend to portray women stereotypically. Women are mainly seen in the realm of the home as wives, as mothers, objectified, they're submissive, they're suffering. The ILO reported in a study that 46% of stories reinforce gender stereotypes. Only 6% of news um, highlights the issues of gender equality or inequality. Only 6%, even though women make 50% of the population. Um, almost 52% of advertisement feature women as uh, sexual objects. Uh, women only make around 37% of the reporters um, in news sources. Um, only 4% uh, of traditional news and digital news stories explicitly challenge um, the stereotypes. In the political realm, 16% um, of 16% uh, of the time, women are um, in politics covered as opposed to men. Um, and this is a global phenomenon, whether you know it's in Europe, in the US, or um, in Asia. Um, so the statistics are there and they're very powerful. What, um, what, what um, pains me the most is really um, uh, the gender-based violence that uh, journalists um, are, are, are going um, through um, when it comes to coverage. Um, um, at a recent UNESCO study, um, we have seen that women journalists face daily threats of assault. Um, to harm them or their loved ones and to destroy their lives. 30% of women surveyed said that um, they self censored themselves in an effort to um, not being targets um, or for their loved ones to being targets. Abuse is not only physical, but it's also um, psychological. Um, and 73% of surveyed women in a study said that um, they face online violence and this has affected them psychologically. Um, so what is the what, what is the UN doing? What is um, in general, other than our office here? Um, um, the, the past five years, um, we have seen an uptake in um, interest in responding to the violence that um, journalists faced, specifically women. Um, UNESCO has launched a campaign, and you may all have seen it, the journalist, the hashtag journalist2 campaign. And um, there's growing momentum there um, in an effort to, to get a safety net for these, you know, um, vulnerable journalists that are out there. So um, I'd like to just leave it um, with the fact that, you know, we will all be on the lookout for uh, women journalists in Ukraine in this, har in this conflict and, um, you know, hope that they stay safe. Maha, thank you for that answer. I mean, those statistics probably make us all pretty mad, right? This is a this is a, a pitiful uh, when you think about re the representation of girls and women and how that is used as a weapon in a lot of ways. I know that our organizers are really keen for us to get to some breakout rooms to have a discussion, which we're excited to do. Farah, I wonder if I can take uh, ask two more questions here, and then we'll get some brief of answers. Of course. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Farah. I think we'll do that, and then we're going to split up. Seema, first, I'm going to come to you because I mentioned work as being a really powerful realm for gender equality. And I know UAP is doing some incre incredible work on supply chains, this you know, deeply admired work. I'd love for you to tell everyone a little bit about that because I think it's a bright spot for progress. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, well, you kind, of, you kind of said it, right? We, the same way we engage with the US government because they have an outsized impact, 
we're engaging with the private sector, especially companies that have really large global supply chains, precisely because supply chains are one of the primary ways that women enter the formal economy around the world. You know, the estimate is that 200 million women form the backbone of global value chains and they make the products that we all use. So, you know, I had tea today. If you've had tea or coffee, or a piece of chocolate or the clothes you're wearing, or if you're wearing sneakers, or if you use an electronic device today, very likely a woman made it, you know, and you have to think about the folks that create these products. And so what we uh, work to do is to engage with these companies that predominantly employ women through their supply chains to really safeguard and support those women's sexual and reproductive health and well-being. And so far, we've worked with 21 companies that have made really meaningful public time-bound commitments to these issues um, that's projected to collectively reach about 2 million people around the world in 17 countries. Uh, but I also want to take a step back and say, you know, for the average woman working in a job like this, they are very likely a line worker who probably does not have a secure contract, secure employment. Um, many times they are migrant workers who are living and working far from home and don't have a social safety net. Often they don't have access to adequate health care. And in many cases, when you think of the context of a factory or a farm, almost in all cases, it's run by a man. And so there's inherent power dynamics where women um, are really... Um, vulnerable to exploitation, sexual harassment, gender-based violence in their workplace. And just like so many of us, they also are likely taking on a disproportionate burden of care, work at home, um, domestic work, child care work. So I wanted to share just a little bit of the context of the lives um, of these women in its sort of holistic view. But also to flip it and say that, you know, there's a lot that these women want in the face of these challenges. And it's not different than I think what most of us would want in the workplace. And that is, you know, dignified um, employment, uh, to be paid fairly, to be valued, um, to be supported for career advancement. We've heard from so many women that they want to run the factory or they want to be on the design team. They don't want to just ditch the clothes. Uh, they want to have access to health care so they can take care of their own health, but also, and we hear this so often, um, the health of their children to secure a better future for their children. And so for those reasons, we were really excited uh, to launch a new kind of a first of its kind entity last year with um, a whole set of partners. So we were co-creating with many partners. There's no heroes here. Um, a new fund called the Resilience Fund for Women in Global Value Chains. And what's unique about it is that it's corporate foundations coming together to co-invest in one shared agenda. And that's really, really rare in the corporate sector. And what they're doing is co-investing to directly support feminist-led movement work in the countries from which they source with unrestricted support. So they're also giving away their power to make the decisions of how the money is used. So I can say more about that later, but I will just share that we were really pleased to see that the fund and the model of the fund was featured by the World Economic Forum as a real innovation in how businesses can partner with their workers and communities to advance social justice. And I'm hoping my colleague Grace can put the Resilience Fund website in the chat so people can take a look at it and admire it and study it for themselves because it really is a bright spot, uh, SEMA, and indeed it is. Rachel, I'm going to ask you one last question and then we'll, before we go into our breakout groups. And that is that I referenced the shadow pandemic, which is the, the rise of domestic violence um, that accompanied the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about what uh, UNFPA is doing in the realm of domestic violence since it matters so much to gender equality. Thank you uh, for this question, Michelle. Um, absolutely. We were one of the first agencies actually that got out there with um, research back in April 2020 that predicted that the COVID-19 pandemic was likely to undermine efforts to end gender-based violence. And that was through two main channels. One uh, pathway was because it reduce prevention and protection efforts, social services and care. And what that means in plain English is that a lot of people were out of school, were out of, a lot of girls especially were out of school. Um, a lot of health needs were diverted. 
um, to deal with the COVID pandemic or people um, you know, were restricted with their movements to be able to even access services. Um, and then the second pathway um, that, that stymied um, real progress in ending gender-based violence was increasing the incidence of violence. And again, it's, it's a kind of common sense if you're, um, if you're at home and if you are um, restricted from your movement away from your home, you could be at home with an abuser. Um, and similarly, um, there could be more stress in your home if there are layoffs because of uh, a job or um, you know, an increase in the cost of food, if there's an increase in a cost of you know, childcare, again, um, that raises stress. Um, all of you together, I mean, I think a lot of us can understand what it's like to be in a small space with your family, especially with children. It's stressful, it's just stressful. And that can manifest in a lot of different ways. So um, the way that UNFPA is dealing with that is super context specific. We work in 150 countries in the world and we, um, our teams are locally hired um, from the communities in which they work. And um, I was really proud to see our team, um, you know, be as creative as possible when it came to um, delivering gender-based violence care. Um, it's very hard in places where there's conflict. Again, hearkening back to the example that, that we discussed earlier in Ukraine, uh, when there's no telephone lines, something like a gender-based violence hotline is very difficult to run. Um, and similarly, uh, if you are restricted of movement with your abuser, you're probably not gonna avail yourself of that telephone line speaking out loud. So what our teams did in a lot of different circumstances was for instance, turn to a texting service, which is like a lot easier for younger people and a lot easier so you don't actually have to verbalize some of those concerns. We did a lot of other things, but I'm cognizant of time and I'm really proud of our team's work and excited to connect in the breakout rooms. Well, that's a, that is a great transition for us. Yes, Rachel and Seema are going to be in a breakout room. Maha is going to come with me, and I think we're going to have some uh, chats with all of you. So with that, Farah and Rachel, over to you for instructions. Yeah, we're going to break into breakout rooms, but I also want to welcome two of our UNA Women Affinity Group leaders, Lady T. Thompson and Anjali Patel, who's going to act as scribes um, to capture the discussion. So um, we're going to start the breakout where you will be able to select your rooms. Come back, everyone. We'll give a few more seconds just to let everyone filter back in. Okay. Uh, I know that was a very quick discussion, um, but we uh, wanted to make sure there was time for some organic uh, conversation um, and a chance to chat with our, our guest speakers. But um, Anjali and Lady T, would you mind um, sharing a very brief readout of your very brief conversations? Yes, well, um, first of all, thank you, thank you everyone who participated. Um, in our breakout session, uh, one of the discussions from two of our seasoned individuals on the call was that historically they were not shocked or surprised by the statistics because historically this has been happening to women. Um, however, the point about women, they don't stop getting pregnant and having babies, you know, and three months later after these 80,000 80, women from U Ukraine, they're still gonna have to have maternal health and. Um, that was a, a, a shocker. I think our group really like to talk about the success stories. So here's a couple of the success stories that's been happening within the communities. Uh, Katie talked about girls getting science and the non-traditional career paths having exposure for um, girls and women to uh, see what it's like in NASA with astronauts and various uh, other activities. Another on Seema, she contributed. She contributed that in New Jersey, Jersey, yes, New Jersey, they passed, passed a law about American history and um, telling American history from all perspectives, including immigration, so that, that uh, her children will have the accurate information about what has happened historically and not encounter some of the uh, misogynism or racial biases that sometimes happen when we leave these things out of uh, history. And then Sarah, she talked about an exhibit that right now um, 
uh, she went to the Sisters Artists 2 exhibit and it showed the commonality of women through using embroidery and textiles and how it helps to tell a story because storytelling is, is a great creative mechanism for women um, in various ways. So that what is some of the highlights from our wonderful break, breakout session. And thank you everyone for your contribution. Thank you so much, Lady T. So we had this similar reaction to the statistics that were discussed. A couple of other things that were mentioned within our conversation was how legislation is not gender sensitive and how privacy laws specifically, I think Maha had mentioned with Facebook, how they banned any rape connotations in the social media platform. So to even be able to discuss these kinds of topics is very difficult. Um, in addition to that, we spoke a little bit about the impacts of social media and how that can uh, contribute to the gendered stereotypes of women. And one of the success stories that I know Marsha was about to share and then we got cut off was, I think I caught part of it where she was saying there's a, the senator in New York who's the first African-American and she has like the majority in New York. So that was wonderful to hear as well. Oh, thank you, Anjali. Yeah, we did not have enough time to talk. So I think the number one thing we learned is that we all need, we need uh, spaces uh, to exercise our solidarity. <laughs> but indeed, but indeed, we, we, uh, we start off venting and then we, and then we celebrated some, some small wins. So uh, thank you for those, those readouts, everybody. So I, I want to just say that thank you, everyone. Thanks to our panelists, first of all, for especially uh, during a busy week and a busy month for taking time to share your expertise with us and your insights. Uh, we really appreciate it. How lucky are we to have these three admirable and extraordinary women join us today to share their work with us. And I want everyone to take with them, you know, a couple of what you learned today. First of all, that progress has been way, way, way too slow, but that nonetheless, this is not a time for despair. This is a time to act because in fact, there's really good evidence. Movements work. Uh, we are lucky to live in a representative uh, democracy here in the United States, and we can ask for something different um, from our government. So being part of the United Nations Association uh, in the United States is really an important way to be part of participatory democracy, by the way, to ask for something fairer and freer for the world. Uh, girls and women. Um, I also think hope you'll find other ways to help carry the the flag for equality. I know we mentioned the snapshot report. It's at equaleverywhere.org, and you can read more about the the 50 of the world's most sexist laws, policies, and norms. And if you want to talk about that, if you want everyone to know, there's social media uh, tools there um, as well. But activists and advocates like you are key to this struggle. We are counting on you to stay in it with us. Um, at the UN Foundation, we won't stop until girls and women are equal everywhere. And we're counting on you uh, to come along with us. So thank you very, mu very much for the opportunity to join this conversation. And now I'm gonna give uh, the floor back to Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Great, thank you, Michelle. And thank you once again, Seema, Rachel and Maha for educating and inspiring us to take action. And as you all know, at UNA USA, we like to end our programs to, with, uh, by giving you an opportunity to advocate on various issues uh, to support the vital work of the UN. Um, I will speak to this, but first, I do hope you consider donating to Ukraine's, uh, the UN's Ukraine Humanitarian Fund, which is a, a fast and effective way to ensure life-saving aid is reaching people affected by the conflict, especially women and girls. In addition, I'd like to give you an opportunity right here um, to text to advocate to advance gender equality. As you know, women's rights are human rights. And today there is still a pressing human rights challenges that women and girls continue to face in schools and workplace at home and beyond. So please urge your members of Congress to create gender equal, a gender equal world by texting women to 30644. Once again, that is W O M E N to 30644. And then lastly, um, there are many other ways that you can take action as a member of UNA USA. When you join UNA USA, you are joining 20,000 other Americans around the country who know the importance of the UN. And we are united in our commitment to global engagement 
and our belief that each one of us can play a part in advancing the UN's mission and achieving the sustainable development goal. So to join our movement, please visit unausa.org slash join, or you can use the QR code on the screen. Thank you once again, everyone. Uh, thank you to our incredible speakers. And um, I just hope you all have a great day, great weekend, and um, stay safe. So thank you.